This is the 18th meeting of criminal law. Thus far in the semester, we have focused on crimes perpetrated or alleged to have been perpetrated by a lone actor. Some of the cases involved multiple perpetrators, even so the issues involved might have been presented without the involvement of more than a single actor. We now broaden our perspective to take in the law that applies to cases of complicity. Accomplice liability is easier to discuss once we take some additional terminology on board. We can make use of some distinctions drawn by the eminent Sir William Blackstone. Although they do not have the same consequences they once did in terms of gradation, they do help us understand the variety of ways in which multiple actors can participate in committing a crime. First on Blackstone's list is the principal in the first degree, the absolute perpetrator, the person who pulls the trigger, snatches the purse, sets the fire, or breaks into the building with her own hand. Next comes the second degree principal, who is present, aiding, and abetting. This is the person who points out the target or distracts the victim or stands lookout, whether at the scene or at a convenient distance from the first degree principal. Then we have the accessory before the fact, who being absent doth yet procure, counsel, or command the principal or principals. Today, each of these three categories of actor are held liable for the same offense, as if each were the absolute perpetrator. The differences of their involvement are sentencing factors that do not bear on guilt or innocence. Suppose an actor hires someone to set fire to a building and someone else to drive the getaway car. All three are equally liable for the crime of arson. Blackstone also defined a fourth category, accessory after the fact, who, knowing a felony to have been committed, receives, relieves, comforts, or assists the principal. Mere accessories after the fact are not liable as accomplices to the principal's offense. They are liable for a separate offense that is variously defined. Our focus will be on the first three categories. Now let's look at a case. Hicks versus United States. Stand Rowe is the principal in the first degree, the absolute perpetrator, or as it is often easier to say, the shooter. The defendant in the case is Hicks, not Rowe. Hicks did not shoot Calvard, the victim. Hicks is prosecuted for murder on a theory of accessorial liability. According to the prosecution, Hicks aided and abetted Rowe. The actus reus of an actor charged as an accessory is aiding or abetting, or if absent, procuring, counseling, or commanding. Aiding is a familiar word. What does abetting mean? Abetting means encouraging. We could say inciting or egging on, but let's stick with encouraging. Or better yet, abetting, a nice lawyer's word. The prosecution alleged that Hicks encouraged Rowe to shoot Calvard by taking off his hat and saying to Calvard, take off your hat and die like a man. Shortly thereafter, Rowe, who was in a dangerous mood, fatally shot Calvard. Hicks was convicted of murder, and the grounds of his appeal are errors in the jury charge. If the deliberate and intentional use of words has the effect to encourage one man to kill another, he who uttered these words is presumed by the law to have intended that effect. The charge invites the juror who thinks Hicks's words had a certain effect to conclude that the prosecution had met its burden of proving that Hicks intended that effect. The error of this is evident 
in a British case not mentioned in the case book. Regina versus Bentley. Derek Bentley and Christopher Craig were detected trying to break into a warehouse. Bentley, then 19, was already in custody when PC Sidney Miles called out to Craig, throw down the weapon. Bentley then called out, let him have it, Chris. The defense argued that Bentley encouraged Craig, age 16, to surrender his weapon. Bentley, incidentally, tested as having a mental age lower than Craig's. The Crown prosecutor argued that Bentley intended to encourage Craig to fire it. Bentley was hanged for murder, the last person to be executed in the UK, which has abolished the death penalty. I do not know how the Bentley jury was instructed. Obviously, if it had been instructed with language like that given in Hicks, the jury could have included, because Bentley intended the words, and the words had the effect of encouraging Craig to fire, that Bentley must have had intended to encourage Craig to fire. Bentley's conviction for murder was posthumously overturned. The Supreme Court finds another error in the charge given to Hicks's jury. If the defendant was actually present for the purpose of either aiding or abetting, but did not do it because it was not necessary, the law says guilt is fastened to his act. The Hicks court holds that mere presence for the purpose of aiding or abetting does not by itself establish aiding or abetting. Consider these hypothetical variations. A. Hicks hears that Roe intends to kill Colvard and goes along to enjoy the show. B. Same as A, but Hicks shouts, Get him, Roe! C. Same as A, but Hicks decides to help Roe if necessary. D. Same as C, but Hicks tells Roe beforehand that he will help if needed. In these four scenarios, we are to understand that in A, Hicks should be acquitted. Mere presence by itself does not constitute abetting or aiding. We are also to understand that in case B, the defendant may be convicted. His conduct constitutes abetting. In case C, we should acquit. Deciding to help while doing nothing does not constitute aiding or abetting. In case D, however, we should let the jury decide to convict Hicks. His having told Roe beforehand that he will help if needed can constitute the actus reus of assessorial liability.